I mean, everybody, uh, every other person that came to my table was wanting a picture to talk about Rock and Roll High School. So I, I really do love that movie. So thank you for still yes. loving it. Like yeah. we do Halloween. Yeah, you, uh, how do you like working with the uh, two Ghostbusters royalty? Oh, well, Harold <laughs> Ramis was a doll and Bill Murray <laughs> was the opposite, though. <laughs> He, he was a genius, great with improv. Every the kitchen scene is wonderful because of him. Uh, very moody, uh, a little hard to work with somebody like that, but obviously he has his reasons, I don't know, but he made the movie. And uh, but Harold Ramis, you would think that Bill would be saying the wise cracks off screen. It was Harold, under his breath, everything, he couldn't stop laughing. I mean, the guy was just so funny. And, uh, but Bill, uh, I think the weight of having to always come up with some a, a line that wasn't written was, you know, pretty heavy for him. Um, but he's fantastic in the movie, and that movie, like Halloween, has just gone on and on too. And and uh, you can watch it on TV, just one scene or two scenes, and crack up, and you go on with your day. <laughs> so it was great. <laughs> Do you have any uh, fun experiences while directing a major play? Oh, um, geez. Well, then in case you couldn't hear that, is do I have any experiences, funny experiences? Directing Major Pain, it was a movie with Damon Wayans in the mid 90s, and uh, about a, a failed, I guess, uh, staff sergeant who has to take on a military type school environment, and he's. <laughs> Unequipped for it, to say the least. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I no, I you know I don't have anything particular other than the fact that, that what I remember about that, which isn't particularly funny, is that we had to shoot. We shot in Richmond, Virginia, in the summer, at one of the hottest summers of the uh, of their existence. Humid, a hundred, and then we shot, if you remembered it, in, in a in like a a sunken like football field. So it, it just kept the heat in too. So it was very difficult, and everyone had was worried about everyone's health you know, because of it. Always got throwing throwing these uh, 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 hand soaked uh, towels around people's uh, people's People necks just to keep it going. Then. Yeah, it wasn't an hydration. <laughs> so uh, that's my memory of it. It's not particularly funny, but uh, it was day in and day out fun because Damon Wayans is as funny. On uh, off screen as he is on, so <laughs> like great guy. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Mayor, uh, how did each of you get interested in, in like film and acting in the first place? Well, I'll, I'll start. I I come from a, a, a background <laughs> of uh, of. Uh, people in the motion picture industry. My dad was a choreographer, dance director, so I grew up with all that. So I had kind of been in my blood to begin with. And then I went to USC Film School, as I mentioned before, and met John Carpenter, etc. So I was always kind of involved in that world, and so it was an easy, it wasn't even a transition, it was an easy evolution for me to uh, try to, you know, then you have to have luck. <laughs> there, there's all that. Um, well, let's see. I went to high school in Brussels in Belgium, and I was the editor of my school paper. I thought I was going to be a writer. I wanted to work for a magazine. I also grew up around the world in different countries, so I knew Spanish and French, and I always thought I was going to do something with languages. Um, I went to college with a major in Russian. Um, I, I really thought I was going to be on a UN track or do something like that, too. But in every country that I lived, Starting in sixth grade in Venezuela, I was always in the pl in the plays that we would put on. I always, but it was for fun. It was nothing that I ever thought, gosh, you know, I want to be an actress because in those countries, I grew up in Morocco and in, in Casablanca, Maracaibo, Venezuela, and then Brussels, Belgium. The television wasn't too great, and really no access to movie theaters like you guys here. So it wasn't big in my life, movies or anything like that. But I did like being in the, all the plays and. Um, so then when I got to college, uh, my roommate was from New York, and uh, the summer my parents had moved to Istanbul, Turkey, and I didn't want to go there, and uh, Lorraine said I could stay at her house. And I happened to walk by the actor's studio, and I said, we'll uh, trade 
um, running the spotlight on the weekends for auditing classes for acting. I was like, oh, that'd be fun. So it was Joanna Miles and Scott Glenn and the Seagull, and I ran the spotlight <laughs> and, uh, and audited the classes. And I met a guy who actually was Joshua White from the Joshua White Show down in Fillmore East. And he said, hey, my sister's an actress. Are you interested in acting? And I said, well, um, yeah, sort of, I guess. And he said, well, let me introduce you to her agent. And his name was Lester Lewis. And I met him. He said, you have a really good look. Why don't I send you around for some television commercials? So that summer, two months in New York before I went back, I was actually transferring from Briarcliff College to Georgetown, in Georgetown. It was going to be the School of Languages and Linguistics. Um, I did three commercials. <laughs> And I thought, I really like this. And I did go to Georgetown for a couple of weeks, but then I got a call to come back up and do another couple of commercials. And I said, I don't think I'm going back to college. <laughs> so again, lucky and uh, to completely not something I thought of as a child to do, but really grateful and glad that I did because uh, it, it is my happy place. <laughs> but now my grandkids are too. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I don't know you. I, I was an LA kid, so I grew up in LA. So it, being an actor didn't seem that far out of reach. And I think you just have a calling to be an actor, you, or you have to. Uh, I don't know. You, you just feel like you must do it for some weird reason. Um, and I was always a, kind of a shy kid, and I think being an actor, somebody gives you lines, tells you where to move, and it was in a way to release all of that and <coughs> perform and just feel alive. You know, you sort of felt alive doing it. So I, uh, I, I guess that's how it happened. So it was easy. I got into a group of uh, kids that were in this company called the Young Actors Company and uh, we started doing plays around town and, and people started getting agents and it just sort of happened. You know, I just sort of fell into it in a natural way. and I was very lucky while I did it. I did a doc, couple Dr. Pepper commercials, which were really huge at the time. Like I said, I was in Greece, I was in Halloween, these two iconic films. Um, but I didn't like the business. I found that I didn't like going on auditions. I hated all of that. I was terrible at auditions. Uh, so I, I decided to go work at Disney World um, because I went there to work with my friend Barbara, who was a producer in the Mickey Mouse Club show. And uh, I saw that there were actually actors, not people with heads, character heads, but actors working in Florida who worked five days a week performing. And you didn't audition, really. It was kind of like the old studio system where they'd be like, you're going to do this and you're going to do that. And so I got to perform for 30 years at Walt Disney World, basically. So I got to do that without having to audition. <laughs> and, you know, and had a really comfortable, wonderful life. And uh, I don't know, but being an actor, I think you have to really feel it. And you have to really want it to be a, and I just had very little drive. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting, if you're interested in being an actor, it's, a, it's an interesting job, yeah. Well, today it would be, I don't know, it would be so different. Very different. I mean, you do your auditions from home now yeah, on your own yeah. phone and you send them in to the casting office. Right. So completely different. But. Right. Thank you. Yes. So with the four weeks and such a small budget, I'm guessing you didn't realize when you were shooting Halloween that it was going to become what it is today. What was your expectation as you were each making the movie of where you thought the movie was going to go. I'll start because I'm an idiot. So I, <laughs> I read it and I really remember, <laughs> remember reading it. Actually, so weird. I was in Vegas for some reason and I was at the pool reading the script and beside me was Tina Louise who was in Gilligan's Island and she was reading a script and I felt so glamorous. But I'm, I'm, I'm reading my script and I'm going, and then the shape goes in, and I was thinking, oh God, what is this? <laughs> and I really, and, and then again, doing the scene with Nick, you know, I'm standing on a box, and I've got a knife tucked under my arm, and you well, know, you can hips. I, your hips can be crushed, and I thought, you know, this is just gonna be bad. And no one will ever see this. 
<laughs> so that's what I thought. <laughs> and I was just excited to get another movie. After Carrie, I had done a couple of television shows. Back then, he did guest stars on some of the series, and so that was fun. And it still did, did commercials. Um, but um, yeah, I, I thought, oh God, please let me remember my lines. Let, let, please, I hope I don't get a pimple. Uh, <laughs> I hope my hair doesn't frizz up. <laughs> And nothing about the big future of this movie except my part in hoping that another casting person will see it and I will get another role. So, but um, it just has turned out wonderfully. And uh, I think we did all recognize, though, that the the intimacy of the working on that set with John Carpenter and Deborah Hill. There was just a a, a nice respect for everybody. The actors weren't looked down upon. A lot of directors think, okay, I'm the master here and you're my pawns. But John kept everything very one-to-one -one and even. And uh, that as a young actress, uh, especially actress, um, I think it just made a big impression on me that you could have that feeling of respect and dignity when you're making a film. And it, it made all the difference for helping you soar and, and really come through with what you're able to give and not feel stifled or insecure and so you don't do your best. But I never imagined in a million years thought that <laughs> we'd be here 45 years later. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, I knew John's work before this, obviously being a friend, so I was following his work. You know, I worked actually on his first film, Dark Star, which started out as a uh, student film. And then uh, he did a all on Precinct 13, and he was doing some TV, and I saw this thing. I, I just assumed it would be another stepping stone towards starting a career, you know, getting known. I didn't see it as anything more than that. I saw it as a little picture that uh, maybe, because I knew John was talented, so, you know, someone would see something in this movie, and then it's like my first movie was called Tag the Assassination Game that no one saw. But some Bobby Carradine was yeah. in. But some people saw it and then gave me my next movie, The Last Starfighter, which was a big, you know, like a Hollywood movie. You know, that's what I thought John was doing. But it just blew up. You know, no one knew that was going to happen. Absolutely. But it took a while. Though, yeah. Wasn't yeah. It? But he wrote Zoom with Peach. That was a television movie yeah. that I was in with Suzanne Somers, and I remember seeing his name and go, Oh, John Carpenter. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that this this kind of thing was something that didn't really happen right. then. I mean, time. there wasn't, <laughs> movies didn't really turn into <laughs> cult movies. I mean, that was right around the time that maybe Rocky Horror was the first sort of thing that sort of became culty. Well, and conventions were really just Star Trek. Yeah, Trekkies I mean, it wasn't, the whole convention scene, nobody so. could have anticipated yeah. that this would happen. But you also can't be a cult movie until enough time has passed, right? right? So that's well, really, it didn't. I, I don't remember Halloween people even knowing about it for two years, really. Yeah. It seemed like it was. And then it was sort of all oh, that little movie. I mean, it would never pass for getting an Academy Award or anything. <laughs> yeah, I got a question. Imagine you were in a TV series guest spot. Uh, my father and I, my late father, one day we watch every afternoon with Airwolf. Yeah. And I noticed you were never saying that. Did you actually see that helicopter? Did I go up in the helicopter? Did you see it, like, oh. in person? Okay. Hold it together here. <laughs> I, I didn't. I did not see the helicopter. You didn't see the yeah. helicopter. But I did use my own son in the in the show because oh, they really? needed a baby. <laughs> so when I went to the audition, I said, "By the way, I have a nine-month-old." <laughs> so I got to use my son Sky. <laughs> that was oh. cute. <laughs> but Jan Michael Vincent was wonderful to work. Yeah, with. I got a lot of graph eight by ten of him. Yeah. 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 Do you have a question in the back? Yeah, it's just kind of a general film industry question for anybody who wants to answer. I've heard you guys talk about acting. You've dealt with producers, directors, screenplays. Everything fits together. You have this beautiful movie. 
but is there one element of that that really kind of rises to the top as the starting point? Like you have the script has to be great, and if you got the social director, a good script can still make a great movie. Is there one aspect of the film industry where you really need to start to try to get that perfect picture? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a good question. I mean, it, it is a collaborative effort, and uh, <clears throat> some of the magic of movies is just that, the chemistry that comes out of mixing some very talented people together. I think this is a very good example of that. You know, first, first of all, you have, you needed the, the brilliance of John in his early years coming up with this, these ideas, this way of approaching it, the way to film it, the way to musically uh, add to it. I mean, all that stuff was very clearly uh, it, uh, kind of an auteur move, but you also had great uh, support, like Dean Cundy, Tommy Lee Wallace. If you didn't have the mask, let's say, if you had the wrong mask, you almost have a different movie. Yeah. You know, that was all Tommy Lee Wallace. So my, my, the point is that it is a director's medium, uh, motion pictures, it, more than, plays and things like that so that is really the uh, the heart and soul of a great movie or a great career uh, you'll see that filmmaker make movie after movie like John had a movie where you just get a certain sense of uh, of artistic uh, you know flavor that uh, you wind up uh, starting to love so that's my answer to that well, thank you so much yeah. Could be the name too, because I don't know that you'd be sitting here if it was still babysitting or babysitter murderer. Right. <laughs> I, mean, I, I do remember thinking, well, this is clever. The every year, maybe it'll show on TV. I mean, you know, the Halloween thing. So, you know, and also the music in the film is fantastic. And you know, when I was seeing the film, I thought it was terrible when I read it. But the thing is, I didn't. You couldn't really realize that he was doing something. Uh, that was a suspense movie, not a violent sort of a horror thing. It was suspenseful. It was a more Hitchcockian sort of thing. It was all, you know, it's not blood, no blood, really. There's no, it's not bloody. And uh, so it's very, it's very clever. I mean, it's smarter than you would think it was going to be, you know. So that's... When uh, Michael Myers gets uh, shot, his mask taken off, how come they didn't use your face? Oh, no, I've always lost Yeah. Look at him. Obviously, too <laughs> handsome. Too <laughs> handsome. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you'd have to ask John that. I think uh, they used a, uh, an actor named Tony Moran who did just a fine job. Um, and I think they had a certain idea of what they wanted a look to be, you know, well, and it wasn't me. Match, uh, Will and Will Stan, yeah, they already had, well, they were going to shoot, I guess, the uh, the very beginning of the movie, and they had that little Hello, angelic kid. Boy, and so I don't, definitely don't look angelic. <laughs> so they're probably trying to match that. Yeah. And uh, I don't know, to me, uh, this isn't a, a knock on uh, anybody's work, or, and especially Tony's or anything like that. I always felt that was unnecessary. I thought it's like, what, what did it tell us anything more right. than we wanted to know about the shape? You'd actually be better off not even seeing what he looked like at that point, or just the shadow of him, or something like that. And I found that that, you know, what did it add to it? So that's always been my gripe about that idea. 